Yeah, so it's good to see everybody. I hope that uh, you all had a good week practicing personification. Um, I was saying a little bit before we started recording that, um, you know, I was able to get through all of the work that, that has been turned in on the Concha si Cafe uh, Google Classroom. So um, if you have work that you turned in, you should have feedback for you now. And um, definitely take advantage of, of this week, um, especially for the feedback session that we'll be having next week. You know, get, get your writing in, um, share it, and hopefully you guys will feel ready when it comes time to actually turn in the work uh, next month. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everybody. It's good to have you all on. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything related to our, uh, our, our session from last week? I know that uh, the video, when I posted it, it was, uh, it was blocked by YouTube um, because of uh, copyright infringement on, on the recording of Commons uh, music video. So there, there was like a day there or so where, where it didn't um, appear, I'm assuming. So although I'm, I'm, I did manage to fix it and it should be up live now. Um, but did, did anybody have any questions or anything that, that was pending from last week? How much was that uh, you had to pay to let the YouTube have that song? You know? I didn't have to actually pay. I just had to cut out that portion of the, of the recording. So, um, you know, the, the music video, you'll see me start to cue it up in the video recording, and then it'll jump to right after, right after we finish it. But, you know, it's not a big deal. Either way, in the Google Classroom, I linked the music video for you so you could watch the video. Um, if you wanted to and follow along with the lyrics, but yeah, no questions about personification from last week. No? All right. Well, that's good. That's, I'm, I'm glad that that must mean that I, I did a thorough job presenting that. Um, so for this week, let's go ahead and get into it. Cause, uh, there's actually a lot that, that I have on our handout, um, for those of you that, that already took the time to view it. But here this week we have our quote coming from none other than Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, Carl Jung is, uh, or was, I should say, uh, born on the 26th of July in 1875 and passed away on the 6th of June in 1961. He was a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology. Um, Carl Jung también fue Uh, este, bueno, fue uno de los estudiantes de, de Sigmund Freud. Um, so he was definitely influenced by the teachings of Sigmund Freud. And he also influenced a lot of people um, in the turn of the century. So uh, you might know a little bit about Carl Jung as, as, a, as a psychoanalyst. Um, pero él escribió, La creación de algo nuevo no se logra por el intelecto sino por el instinto de juego actuando a raíz de una necesidad interna. La mente creativa juega con el objeto que ama. And in English, the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct acting from inner necessity. The creative mind plays with the objects it loves. What do y'all think? ¿Cómo les parece lo que dice aquí el camarada? What does Carl Jung's quote say to you? And it's in our chat now, too, if you want to reference it. No? No one has any, any initial thoughts? Initial reactions. Probably that the um, I guess that part of the mind that is known for creativity is what takes I guess um, more precedence over you know the other side of the brain that's more about like analyzing. I guess it kind of plays two parts. So you're saying like. Um, the mind is is like compartmentalized is that kind of how you're you're trying to describe it um i guess kind of 
I guess what I'm trying to say is that like sometimes creating something doesn't happen intellectually. Something it's like versus like instinct. Something that maybe like feeling versus knowing type of thing. Hmm. It's just like to, 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 I don't know, to create some like a character. I mean, it takes more than just like okay, stating the like the facts about a person, like knowing how they feel and how they react to certain circumstances, like the emotions that they play or they, they show. I think they tell a better story of creating a character than just like you know, very like, cold descriptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, what's going to be more interesting, us reading a detailed description of a person's um, biography or their story, you know, told in a way that's actually like a narrative, which which one's going to be a more interesting way of learning about a person? So, yeah, I can see that. Um, Nikolai is saying that it's a weird way of saying necessity is the mother of invention. Um, yeah, I think that that could be a way to look at it, right? I mean, let's read it again. The creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct acting from inner necessity. The creative mind plays with the objects it loves. I mean, if it's necessity, I think that it's, you know, the, the inner necessity probably is coming from the inner need to create. Yeah. yeah, I kind of feel like play, the play instinct is is kind of the key phrase there, as Ani is pointing out in the chat. Right. Hey, Abraham? Well, like uh, Nikolai said, the first part seems like uh, necessity brings like creation of new things. Like every time you hear something about a new discovery, that came out of an accident. And the second part kind of lets me know look, that we tend to focus on things that we like mm -hmm. and don't think outside of the box because we are focused into those things instead of looking outside of it. Hmm. Interesting. Ma? It reminds me of um, an anime, actually. It's uh, about basically these two pianists who um, are both trained, but one of them kind of loves everything that has to do with the piano and music. So they're, I guess, more willing to kind of delve into their own emotions to create something unique versus the second player who's just classically trained mm -hmm. and trained by like these famous composers to basically just copy what they're doing. And in the first instance, like the first pianist has a better chance of creating something because it loves, he loves playing the piano. He loves, you know, just playing with an instrument and kind of making his own like arpeggios versus like the second one who just is good at, you know, reading music and kind of copying what other composers have written for him instead of like trying to do something out of just love and create, you know, kind of just creatively mm -hmm. playing with notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, that, that, that definitely does um, speak to, I think, what even Nikolai is saying about, you know, creativity plays a bigger role than genius. You know, a person could do something creative, like play an instrument, and they can do it well in terms of a technical sense. But if they're lacking that, that love for it, that, that real sense of, of, uh, the instinct to play, you know, as in, in the words of Carl Jung, then, you know, that it may not be or it may not come across as the most soulful of, of playing styles or methods. Right. And I kind of I kind of think that that's that's maybe where this is, is headed in the way that it's it's structured. Any other thoughts? Ani? For me, the um, can everybody hear me? I'm like this. Yeah. Is, I'm new to the headsets. So I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, the when it says that the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, I feel like 
you know, the, the intellect is, is the part of the brain that orders things. And, and I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the, of the discussion. So if I'm repeating what somebody already said, just I apologize. Um, and it orders what it already has in its possession. Um, so you're, you're working with, with what, it, what is already in your realm and in your grasp to create something new. You have to be able to break out of those things that you already know, that you already have possession, that you, that's already been created. Um, you have to go somewhere else, you know, beyond that. Um, that the intellect, by definition, is that part of your brain that is taking the knowledge and information that you already have and putting it in, a, in little in little categories. So it's like the it's like going to the library and thinking that you're going to, you know. Um, you're going to create something new there. No, this is this is our, an archive. Your intellect is is what's um, what's processing information that's around you. But to be able to create something new, you have to go to that place where there's where there's nothing, mm -hmm. and um, and also the the word play really. Um, really I can relate to that really uh, because I, I noticed that if I'm in that structured state of mind sometimes it is very hard to actually create that I have to go to a, a like a, a relaxed place of um, just allowing myself to be you know mm -hmm. and almost to the point where I get scared I'm like this is not going to be productive I'm way being way too much of a daydreamer and just slumming around doing whatever I feel like but in that space of just allowing everything to get to go loose it's like um then you know it kind of allows you to be in a space for a creative uh creativity to take place so I those are the things that I took from that hmm. and again I apologize if I repeated anything anybody said so sorry for being late no it's all good you actually came in right as as we were starting the discussion. So yeah, thanks for, for those insights. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I personally, when I looked at this, this quote, I, I was gravitated a lot to the, uh, to the play instinct concept there. Uh, San Juanita, I think you had something that you wanted to add and then Mauricio. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know. I think it was, um, I don't know who said it, but I was, I was thinking, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm thinking, that uh, is because I'm very tired. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all good. I was thinking, you know, it, because it, it does say the creation of something new. Mm -hmm. So and, and it would make me think about when I want to write something, I have to set the mood. <laughs> so like like uh, Annie was saying, you know, I have to. There's certain kind of there's some music that makes me, I guess, I guess you want to say creative. You know, there's certain songs that. You know that that brings some memory or something, and I feel like writing right away. And it's not it's not like you know it's, and it has, you have to be. I think in order for me to be creative, it's not me going to a dictionary and saying, "Okay, let me write a poem," you know, using all these fancy words. Because you know, uh, it's just it has to be. The only way that I can create something is if I am. Um, I, I, I want, like, and I read the inner necessity of wanting to express myself, you know, and I'm assuming that this is the way it is for, you know, artists, you know, people that uh, paint or draw or make music, you know, it's, it's, um, that inner necessity to, to want to express yourself in whatever way that, um, that will be, that's going to say Gosh, I lost my turn of thought. I just think that you have to love what you do mm -hmm. in order to create. Mm -hmm. Because as, as much as I sit down and say, I'm going to write, I'm going to get a notebook, and I'm going to get my dictionary. Uh-uh. Not, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. there's no way. But mm, dictionary is a way. My music, my notebook, my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I set the mood. Uh-huh. Because I want to, you know, I want to create, I want to express. 
-hmm. because that's what I love to do. You know, I that's what I was thinking. You know, no, 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 no matter how much I've gone to school, I could have whatever degrees. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to be, I have to love what I do in order for me to do or to create something new. I, mm -hmm. That's what I gathered. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I just mixed it up. No, 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 not at all. I think that you know what, what you're saying is is probably something that everybody else can can kind of relate to, and that um, everybody that is creative, I honestly believe that we all have that inner need, you know, to to express ourselves, and so you know we do it in a lot of different ways, whether that be through cooking or you know, through our writing or, you know, creating a new song or even just playing a song that, that already exists. Like there's, there's definitely a lot of ways in which that inner need does, does get expressed. Uh, Mauricio and then Miss Luz. I don't know if it was already said, but I guess like when you use your intellect, I mean, there are kind of rules that you're bound by regarding whatever the subject it is and i think with creativity you i think ani had mentioned this earlier you just let you know you let loose and all those like the strict rules of say like chemistry or whatever the content is they kind of like they just um they don't matter because you're thinking creatively i think with intellect there's more of a of a purpose for why you do things like the research but to find an answer and creatively it's like the process is itself like you know the fun of it and its mission is just you know the process of it so there's less rules if you're just creating mm -hmm. yeah i like that thinking of it in a scientific method almost <laughs> yeah miss loose well it made me think of when my son would I think this just froze. Ask me Legos, and I would break out the instructions and try and follow. And he would just do his own thing with it. <laughs> nothing about what the picture, nothing at all about what it was about. <laughs> it was, it was going to be his own thing, and uh, it was always that way. Ever since he was <laughs> two, three, with blocks, and then later with the Legos, it was just his medium to mm. construct and to build. And and um, yeah, that creative mind that play that it does happen in a different part of the brain for me it's you know intellect that's followed instructions but not for him so, yeah. so that's where it that took me i like that yeah you know there's um well you know there there is the uh the right brained and left brained idea you know that people that are right-handed you know their predominant uh brain like machinations happen in the left side of the of the uh, brain's hemisphere, which is dominated by I think it's um, reason and uh, or, or it controls our, our uh, brain functions that that are based in reason, right? And then left-handed people, you know, it's our right brain that is the dominant brain, and the right brain is the one that is uh, about like imagination and dreams and you know things like that um so kind of like from the beginning what, what mauricio was saying about maybe like there being a compartmentalization right there's the intellect and then there's the play and they they sometimes will will come close to each other but they'll, they'll always be kind of apart um you know that that could be partly what, what carl jung is saying here um but I think it's also really interesting when we think about what he's saying and that it is the creation of something new. Um, it's not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. So to create something new means that, right, you're, you're starting from scratch. But like, I think it was Ani who was saying, you know, there's, there's also, you know, that, that concept of working with what you have already, right? So what part and this is a question for you guys. What part does the intellect play in the act of creation? How do you think the intellect, you know, starts to find its way into our process of creating? Any, any thoughts on that? I think maybe it has to do, like, the intellect kind of builds, like, the world 
of which creativity can play in, kind of sets those regulations, I guess, mm -hmm. those laws. And creativity, I guess, allows you to know what you can change of those rules. Like, it's like you have to be, like, for example, if you know that you're only in the X and Y axis, mm -hmm. like maybe the intellect can tell you you can only play on these fields, and creativity can later say, well, I want to play in the Z, you know, mm -hmm. access as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of like knowing what gauge your creativity can break, what limits mm -hmm. it can break. Hmm. I like that. I don't know why I've been so like mathematical lately. It's not me at all. <laughs> but it is a language, you know, math is its own language. And, you know, people can be very creative in that language. Um, Ani wrote in the chat, you know, that it's maybe the, when, you know, we're editing and bringing order to the first draft or ideas made by creativity. You know, I think that we don't want to underestimate the importance of the intellect either, right? Um, because that's very true. You know, even even painters, honestly, even a painter is going to edit their work. You know, they're going to find ways to, you know, mix, mix paints so that it, it gets the right hue. You know, they're going to maybe use a solvent to sort of erase or blend um, you know, their paint colors so that things get a little bit more refined. Um, you know, it's, but yeah, yeah, I, I guess, you know, <laughs> I see that, uh, that, that Tina is talking about, you know, telling the intellect to shut the hell up. You know, that is definitely a part of, of, uh, the, the creative process too, because yeah, maybe the intellect can, can get it, get in the way at times. Um, there is a fine line. For sure. Uh, and like Mauricio says, you write drunk, edit sober. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely a line. It's, it's kind of like a meme for, for writers, you know. Um, but I think that, yeah, we want to definitely acknowledge that, that it is kind of like being a well-rounded mind, right? The creative mind is not just the uh, the 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 creative childlike you know the mind that that wants to consistently play it can also be the slightly more mature mind that says okay you know this this is a really good line when i created it i really liked it but this is how i can now make it even better or oh i see what i did right there let me try and amp that up and make it an even stronger metaphor you know i bring that up because in the uh especially in the writing that I was just reviewing right now for the personification uh, poems that they, that were turned in. I could really see that there was a lot of fun that was being had in trying to find ways to extend the metaphors. You know, some of you wrote about um, like, you know, not to call, call y'all out specifically, but like, you know, Caro wrote about coffee, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's about coffee. Um, you know, and Miss Luce wrote about uh, what I interpreted to be the hospital, you know, or a medical facility. And, you know, being able to see those connections within the writing, I could tell that y'all were having actually a pretty good time um, writing it. And you then went back and you actually polished it. So I could actually see the process through the writing. Um, because I'm sure that it wasn't something that just came out just like that on, on one go. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's, I think it's important to acknowledge, right, that, that there is a, a process to writing. And that, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, especially when we talk about characterization, you know, the more you practice characterizing um, you know, different characters, whether they be fictional or a place or anything like that, the more you're going to find that your intellect is actually going to start to take over um, in ways that, that actually push your creativity even further. And it starts to become fun. It actually starts to become an enjoyable process using your intellect. Um, and I can say that because at least in my process for writing, when I've been commissioned to do poems, you know, at like zine fests and things like that. And I, and I have those little questionnaires that I have my customers fill out, you know, using their responses, I have to be creative and kind of like what Ani was saying, and I have to work with what I've got, 
you know, so my creativity in creating a brand new poem that's never been written before, you know, I'm creating something new while using my intellect and having fun all at the same time in playing with words and playing with people's uh, responses, you know, so, so all of this stuff starts to really come together once you start to recognize it and, and refine it over time. Abraham, you got, got something to add? Oh, no, that you were saying, yeah, I remember you were working on some points when we were going in Synfest. Mm -hmm. And I know how, like, how you structure some questions to give you that freedom, some, like to be a little bit random, so you can play with those ideas. Mm -hmm. So you play with both of things, the intellect, and also the space of creativity. Yeah. Yeah, the space of play, right? Because play is really important in the creative writing process. You have to have fun in doing what you're doing um, or else it becomes a chore. And so um, I think that that's, that's definitely something that, that yeah, you you want to just, just kind of be aware of, I guess, you know, regardless of what level of, of writing experience you have. You know, it's, it's, it's always meant to be fun and when you start to sit and edit that can also be fun it is a fun process so um and it can also start to get fun too when you start to really think about uh like theory you know um in a lot of ways you know when when especially for anybody that that went to college and studied writing or any kind of the uh, humanities where, where you were reading the text of, of past authors and artists, you know, it could get very boring, right? And, you know, I have to be honest with you guys today, I hope the lesson doesn't get boring, but I really wanted to make sure that that we talked about a theory in, in creative writing that is very core to characterization. So just to have, again, here the definition for characterization. Uh, characterization is, the creation or construction of a fictional character. Right? That's how most people understand characterization. Um, and we've been talking a lot, or at least I've been approaching it a lot with, a lot with the second uh, definition, which is a description of the distinctive nature or features of someone or something, with distinctive nature being the main thing, right? It's what makes that person or that, that individual unique um, that you're trying to describe in your writing. But I think that, you know, doing that is sort of an indirect way of characterizing people, right? Talking about the way that they respond to stressful situations. That's an indirect way of characterizing them. Um, you know, talking about the types of objects that they carry in their pockets, you know, or that they put particular value on. That's an indirect way of of characterizing someone. But when we're talking about now writing in the like, you know, more long form sort of way, if you're talking about writing a, a novel or if you're talking about writing a short story or even doing a piece of flash fiction, you know, where flash fiction is probably less than 200 words, 250 words at the most, I mean, we're talking about really, really short pieces you're going to start to see that you're creating archetypes or you're building off of archetypes um, when you're describing a character. And so this is where I think, you know, I want to, I want to end our, our uh, series of, of creative writing lessons because the archetype is, I think, really important for us to understand. Um, do I have anybody that would like to actually read for us the, uh, the definition here for archetype any volunteer just feel free to jump in hey, I'll be here. Right, go ahead mom archetype from the ancient greek archetypes meaning the original pattern or model from which all things to the same kind of copy on which they are based the model of first form, for example. Mm -hmm. Two, in Jungian psychology, the collective inheritance, unconscious ideas, pattern or thought of each, etc. Universally present in individual psyches. Thank you. Concept, the archetype in the theory of the human psyche, 12, 
universal mythic character archetypes residing within our collective unconscious that represents the range of basic human motivations. Yes, thank you. <laughs> y aquí en español, we have el arquetipo. Viene del griego antiguo, arquetipos, definido como el patrón original o molde de donde todas cosas similares son copiadas o en cual están basadas. Un modelo o forma primigenia, prototipo. Y en psicología junguiana, una idea, patrón de pensamiento, imagen, etc., heredado colectivamente sin conciencia universalmente presente en las psiquis individuales. Y como ven aquí, Carl Jung usó el concepto del arquetipo en su teoría de la psique humana, identificando 12 personajes arquetipos universales y míticos viviendo dentro de nuestra inconsciencia colectiva, cuales representan el rango de las básicas motivaciones humanas. So... These are some, some uh, I think, sort of big concepts, I want to say, um, that, that Carl Jung uh, expressed. But in the chat, I just dropped in, I think, the core idea of Carl Jung's uh, archetypes, right? The Jungian archetypes. They're part of the collective conscious, uh, unconscious, excuse me, part of the collective unconscious and they represent the range of basic human emotions. So ultimately what an archetype is, is a figure or a way of approaching the world that everyone universally can kind of see or understand. Um, and it's, at least according to Carl Jung, it goes beyond borders, beyond cultures, because in every culture that creates stories, every culture has a, a character that is a hero, that is a villain, that is a sage, that is a rebel. You know, all storytelling has some of these very, very similar characters that are represented throughout the history of man, ultimately. But the key here is that there are the range of basic human emotions. There are the motivations why people behave the way they do. So any questions so far? You guys kind of following me on what an archetype is? Yeah, all right. So, aquí les voy a presentar los arquetipos. So, now this handout is a is a long one um and i tried to be as as thorough as possible and i have to actually give credit to um connor neal uh which is i believe he's sort of like a motivational speaker you know person that does uh workshops for for a lot of uh like businesses and so his approach to this and where i got most of this information in the form that you see it um, his approach was talking about like the leadership and, you know, how you can recognize these different archetypes in your own personality as being kind of like, you know, one of the main ones that might, might be part of your personality. Uh, Carl Jung, you know, he felt like we in all of these different archetypes inhabit us um, because they're a way in which we, we recognize the world. Um, and so you know, some of the ways in which this is laid out, it, it's, it's about, you know, how those particular archetypes um, fit or, or, you know, build on the psychological ego of, of an individual. Um, so, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll try to explain that a little bit uh, as we go, but um, keep in mind, we're talking about literature, right? So in literature, in writing, um, in all forms of storytelling, ya sea en películas o hasta en música, uh, estos arquetipos existen. So we start off with the first one, the caregiver, el cuidador, and their motivation, so the type, right, la, la clasificación de, de el cuidador es el ego, and their main motivation is to provide service. Um, it's pretty obvious if you think of the name, right? The caregiver obviously wants to give service. 
but their cardinal orientation. This is kind of like their objective, their reason for existing is to provide structure to the world, according to Carl Jung. You know, Carl Jung argues that the caregiver wants to make sure that in some ways, you know, the, the status quo is maintained and that, you know, the, the ego is served as in like the, the area of the brain that, that tells you, you know, that, that you are your, your intellect ultimately, you know, the, the one that, that, that builds on, on the core personality of a person, that one is the one that's being served. Um, through service to others. Luego tenemos aquí también el creador o artista. And the creator artist, you know, they're, they're the origin of their motivations. You know, it's, it's their soul, right? What Carl Jung defines as the soul. Um, it's kind of like a, like a connection to, to one's spirituality in the way that, that he describes the soul. Um, and their main motivation is to be innovative, right? So the creator, the artist always wants to be innovating, be fresh, renew, um, be new. And to out of the chaos that is, that is creativity, they, they actually want to create structure through their creativity. They want to funnel all of the chaos into something that can be displayed or performed or whatever. Then we have the ruler, el soberano. Y aquí, pues, es un poquito diferente, you know, but the ruler ultimately is in for their self. Um, they want to exert control. That's their main purpose. That's their main motivation. Um, and, you know, through that, they want to provide structure to the world. So, as you can see, we have the first three on our list here that are hoping to provide a structure to the world in their own different ways, but that's what they're they're ultimately doing. Um, and you could probably find different different versions of this in in you know probably in movies would be the one where you could see this the most, um, or you can see it like definitely in, in literature throughout history. Luego tenemos el inocente, so the innocent character. Is going to be a character that is looking to satisfy their their ego, their their out outward uh, presentation to the world, um, you know, and that's through safety, right? They want to achieve a sense of safety, um, and their their cardinal objective, you know, their their reason for existence is to um, basically find or reach paradise. Right? They're always yearning to, to find a paradise, a world in which everything is perfect and they are completely safe. And so all of the things that they do is so that they can eventually achieve paradise. The explorer, same thing. They want to find paradise, but they want to find it through a sense of freedom. You know, For them, it's about a sort of spiritual freedom, um, something that they feel within themselves that... that means that they no longer are, you know, shackled by anything. And then there's the sage, the sadhya. Uh, for them, it's about themselves, right? It's about it's sort of like uh, understanding themselves. It's about understanding the world and the universe and their connection to it. And through that sense of understanding, that's how they achieve their idea of paradise. So, um, you know, these characters, you know, they would be characters that, like in the case of the Explorer, you know, it's a character that's constantly going off on you know, on their own. They might even be considered like an anti-hero, whereas the Innocent is probably going to be a child more often than not. And the Sage is probably kind of like the Hermit living up in the mountains, you know, that nobody really has any kind of interaction with. Then we move on. Here's the hero. So el héroe es algo típico que tenemos en, en nuestros cuentos. Um, the hero is about the ego. So it's about, you know, portraying to the world their, their mastery, right? They are the masters of, of, of whatever it is they set out to, to conquer. And for them, it's all about leaving a mark on the world. They want to be remembered or they want to 
you know, change things and in some way feel valued because they were the ones that changed it. Um, and the funny thing is that the hero is basically also pursuing the same kind of goal as the rebel, except that the rebel, their approach to it is through liberation. It's through feeling a sense of, of uh, you know, that, that spiritual sense of, of liberation, no longer being tied down to, um, to whatever the, the status quo is. Um, they also want to leave a mark on the world, but usually it's through actually uh, creating anarchy and rebirth. So for the rebel, it's maybe somebody like, you know, um, I don't know, like Batman or the Joker. You know, they, they could be seen as one and the same. They want to leave a mark on the world, but create the world in their own image. Then you also have the character that is called the wizard or the magician, el mago. And for them, it's about power. Um, you know, their way to leave a mark on the world is to achieve ultimate power. Um, and it's, it's about themselves, and, you know, kind of like uh, what we were saying with the, uh, with the sage. It's about, it's about their understanding um, and their ability to master whatever it was that they were seeking out to learn. Um, so that's, that's how the, the wizard or, the, or the, the magician is typically portrayed. Then there's the everyman, right? el tipo cualquiera. Uh, for them, it is about the ego. It's about their, their outward connection to others, right? So for them, it's, it's about connecting to other people, um, but it's about feeling a sense of belonging you know, and not rocking the boat. Um, you know, Hamlet is considered to be the everyman character. Um, and that's because, you know, throughout the entire play, Hamlet doesn't want to do something that would rock the boat. He doesn't want to, to sort of call too much attention to himself until the very end when he finally acts. Um, and then that's what sort of, you know, creates the tragedy that is Hamlet. Um, then you have the lover. El amante. And for them, you know, it's about intimacy. Everything is about intimacy and creating a sense of intimacy with others. So they also have that social uh, objective in their life and their role. Right? They want to connect to others, but on a, on a very, um, almost on a spiritual plane. Then there's the jester, el bufón. And the gesture is about just themselves, right? Enjoying themselves, living life to the fullest. And they want to make other people feel like, you know, it, life is, is a little less uh, difficult, a little less hard. They want to uh, liven up the world. So, any questions so far? I see some comments here in the... Uh, in the chat, a ver qué dicen. <laughs> El diablo como la lotería. Is that you, Abraham? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Mauricio el borracho. Yeah, yeah, this may be a little bit more accurate, you know, seeing as how Abraham was the one drinking wine during our chats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious about the, um, and maybe this is coming, and if so, just tell me to wait, but I'm really, uh, I'm curious about the the overlap, you know, about how these um, these characters who are um, who are coming from the ego or coming from the soul or coming from the self, mm -hmm. um, they have, you know, they have different objectives, but mm -hmm. their core, I guess, the source mm -hmm. of of what they're doing is is similar. I'm interested to see how these um, how these categories intersect with each other. I, I thought when you first started, I was like very clear. I'm like, Oh yeah, I know which one I am. And then I was like, no, I really don't. <laughs> it's not that clear. And I think that's, that's really, um, a little bit scary that, um, maybe it's just that we're, we're more, we're more complicated than, than these categories. But it, um, I just think it, it, it can also, be a little scary to consider that maybe we don't, uh, maybe we don't understand our, you know, where we're coming from or what our, what our 
prime objective is, or maybe we are a combination of, you know, more than we have like a primary and then a, a secondary. Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, yeah. if you have anything to share on that front, I would really love to hear that. Well, keep in mind that according to Carl Jung, we have all of these within us, right? So these archetypes are part of our collective unconscious. You can go from country to country and you could read stories that have all of these characters, regardless of whether or not those civilizations ever even cross paths. You know, if you look at things like, um, for example, the Popol Vuh, which is the, uh, the like creation text done by the Mayans, they actually talk about a great flood and they also talk about a fire right that destroys the world what else sounds like that the book of genesis right the the holy text of the hebrew people of the jewish people um, and christians and the popol vuh was written i think before the the bible um and they those people never at least as far as I know, they, they never shared any kind of cultural notes, any cultural connection, right? So according to Carl Jung, all of these archetypes, all of these, these characters and these events that are, that are, you know, tropes considered to be tropes in, in literature, you know, they, they speak to something that's within us, within our deep unconscious, our collective unconscious as a human race. And as I was reading the, the characters, you know, you might have identified with one or more, you know, but they're all you. They all live inside of you. And at any given point, they're going to come out. But more than that, as you're, you know, interacting with the world, as you're telling a story, especially as a writer, you, one of those personalities is going to come out one of those personalities is going to be the tool through which you tell the story, you know, at any given time. One of the things that, that we, that we've talked about before is the hero's journey, right? By Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell actually took the work of Carl Jung in, in the 12 archetypes and he adapted it to his hero's journey. So if you were to look at, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey archetypes, you'll see that some of them are very similar and some of them are a little bit different. And there's actually some that were combined together. If you look at somebody like the hero and you look at the rebel, you know, you'll notice they, they want the same exact thing, right? They want to leave a mark on the world. It's just the way in which they do it. You know, one of them is, is considered the, the, you know, protagonist, right? The, the hero. Whereas the other one is going to be the anti-hero, but ultimately they're one and the same. And they're going to follow the same hero's journey. Uh, Nettie? I have a question. Like, try, when you're trying to build a character arc, or the way I picture it is like, does it make sense to uh, start your character with one archetype and somewhere in the middle of Act 2 or Act 3, when they recognize their flaw, they move or they shift to another archetype because the previous one doesn't longer fit. Yeah, I mean, think about it as like, you know, the evolution of, of people, right? People evolve over time. People are never going to stay the same. You know, their personalities might, might be similar, but their motivations will change over time. And that's what we're really talking about. You know, when we're characterizing someone, you know, in, in writing or in poetry, you know, we're characterizing them based on their motivations. What is their reason for doing what they're doing? That's a much more direct way of, of showing us, you know, their actions and their, their reason for thinking the way that I think. <clears throat> any other questions so far or any other comments, Abraham? This kind of reminds me how we ended up with the career personality test that we probably everybody here took at a certain point in their lives. I mean, I remember a lot of people say, oh, I, I never became an artist or never became a scientist. It's because of that. Like, we're complex people, and sometimes mm -hmm. 
the environment or circumstances change and we end up taking different paths or different characteristics that you were talking that we have within ourselves. Mm -hmm. So this is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things about Carl Jung is that uh, people, you know, they, they, they criticized him for being reductionist and for also, um, you know, not, not always being, I would say, accurate in terms of, of gender uh, equality, you know, the way in which women are, are characterized in, in literature a lot of times, especially in his time, right, it, it was not done in a favorable way. You know, women were a lot of times portrayed as only being the caregiver or only being the innocent. And that's it. You know, women were not considered to be heroes. Women were not considered to be rebels, you know, but that's changed over time. And it's, you know, one of those things that like you want to make sure that as you're writing any kind of character, you're not being either cliched or generating stereotypes, right? Because all things are possible. Every person has all of these qualities within them. Yes, some of them may be more dominant in certain times of their of their existence. And in your story, your character might start off as like, say, a jester, right? As being kind of like the Joker character that, that nobody takes serious. But over the course of their story, you know, they're going to go through that uh, cycle of, of death and rebirth. And then at the very end, they might become the most mature person in the world, you know, off the top of my head, can't really think of, of any, um, movies that show that particular character arc. Um, but you know, think of any kind of movie that, you know, has a character that's really immature at the beginning and at the very end, they finally show that they've matured, you know, that's, that's that gesture, uh, character arc, you know, for the, Donald Trump? Uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, Game Sorry. of Thrones. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Big. That's actually a really good example. Thank you, Mauricio. Yeah. For anybody that's seen that movie, Big, with Tom Hanks, you know, in that movie, Tom Hanks is, he, he starts off actually as a little boy. And through magic, he somehow wakes up one morning and is a full grown adult. Right. And so he spends the entire movie learning what it means to be an adult, only to at the very end, recognize that he has to also take care of himself as a child. Right. His inner child is very important and is what helped him be successful as an adult. So, you know, you come full circle that way. That's a really good example of the gesture you know, and their character arc. Um, Forrest Gump, if that was an archetype, it would probably be based on the, uh, the innocent archetype where, you know, Forrest Gump starts off as this innocent, you know, individual with autism and he spends his entire life, um, you know, put in circumstances that force him to adapt and change continuously. Until at the very end, you know, Forrest Gump is now a little bit wiser and, you know, really has affected the people around him. And that that's where really you see the majority of the character arcs is in the people around him, specifically in the character arc of Lieutenant Dan, who's his uh, like best friend throughout most of the movie. Uh, I see. Tyrion Lannister. I never saw Game of Thrones, so I don't really know um, who that is. But uh, Mauricio, are you asking about Forrest Gump being the everyman? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could probably make the argument that Forrest Gump is the everyman character. He right? doesn't really want to change the world. He wants to just be safe in it, you know, and to make others feel safe in it as well. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments before before we move on in the handout? All right. So moving on in the handout to sort of help you all out as you think about how you want to maybe use these archetypes. Here are their desires, fears, and talents. And so these are broken up into the different classifications, right? 
remember when we talk about the ego this is the the outward expression of of their their motivations right so it's about how other people perceive them um and for el inocente it's about you know be free free to be you and me right this is sort of like kind of like the hippie idea of of everyone, you know, it's all peace and love, and, and everybody deserves to, to, to have their place. Um, and, you know, not to say that that's like a, a negative thing, but that's that's kind of like their mantra. Right? That's that's the way that they, they go about um, living their life. And in most stories, that's going to be challenged. Right? They're going to be challenged to think that that might not be the best way for everyone to live. Um, but that's what ultimately does motivate them, too. Right, because their core desire is to achieve paradise, right? To have a world that is utopian and where everyone is happy. That's why they're also known as the utopian, um, or they could also be the traditionalist, you know, a person that wants to revert back to a happier time. Um, their greatest fear is to be punished for doing something bad or wrong. And so that would be part of their trials that they would undergo, you know, they would be reprimanded, they would find, you know, that something that they did was done incorrectly. And so then they feel bad about themselves. And so what do they do? They make sure that they learn from their mistakes and do things the right way. Um, their weakness can come be that they come across as boring for all their naive innocence. You know, they might not be a character that is perceived to be very, uh, you know, active or, 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 just simply too innocent, right? Um, and their talents would be their faith and optimism. They always come across as a character that is is very happy-go-lucky, always believes, always has hope, um, and can be maybe a little bit of a dreamer. You know? um, any questions so far? I thought I heard a little, little notification. Did somebody raise their hand? No. Ah, Tina, did you have a question? No, that was an accident. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Mauricio, sorry. Is that it? Yeah, quick question. Mm -hmm. For the innocent, um, the strategy says to do things right. Um, what if it, the archetype of the innocent is to learn that maybe what they were doing was maybe bad in the sense that it may have fulfilled, say, like, the laws, but it wasn't, like, the true right thing to do? Could their art, could their art be relearning what is really right or wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, think about, like, children's movies. You know, children's movies a lot of times will have that type of character that is sort of innocent, you know, um, thinks they're doing the right thing. And then, you know, they learn that it was actually hurting someone else. And so their innocence is kind of lost in that way, but they know that they can achieve and they're, they're usually brought up, you know, or, or backed up by some kind of mentor figure or their, their allies. And so then, you know, they, they end up actually achieving whatever it was that they meant to achieve in their hero's journey. Because remember, you also always want to think of these archetypes as being kind of like the beginning to your hero in the hero's journey, right? You'll build on this, but this is kind of like the scaffolding that, that you start off with. This is the skeleton of your characters. So, any other questions before we continue? All right. <clears throat> so then we have the everyman, right? So the everyman is also one of those uh, ego characters. You know, they they want to fit in. They want to not rock the boat, basically. Um, for them, it's all men and women are created equal. It sounds very similar to the uh, to the innocent character, right? Um, and their desire is to connect with others. To belong is always going to be their goal. Right? They want to be a part of something. 
um, and they want to feel like they are a part of something. They might not start off that way, though. You know, this might be a character that starts off feeling like they don't fit in with everyone. And through their hero's journey, they're going to eventually um, find out that they were they were always, you know, that that person that was there for everybody or whatever the case might be. Um, their greatest fear is, again, to be left out. And in some cases, it's to stand out from the crowd, you know, to, to be overexposed. Um, and they desire to just kind of be like, just fly under the radar, you know. Um, the way that they, they achieve their goal a lot of times is to develop ordinary solid virtues, to be down to earth and to have the common touch as, as what's written right there. Or as I put it in Spanish, simplemente ser común y corriente, you know, como cualquiera. Uh, their weakness is losing one's own self in an effort to blend in or for the sake of superficial relationships. So this is where you'll see a lot of times, um, especially this one, for the sake of superficial relationships. You know, you'll, you'll see a character sort of give up who they normally are because they want to please everyone, right? And their hero journey, their arc is going to result in them getting to the point where they feel so bad about giving up the thing that made them special um, that, you know, they'll, they'll kind of go into a little tailspin and then come back and be very secure in who they always were. Um, and their talents are their realism, their empathy, and their lack of pretense, you know, their ability to just sort of get along with everybody. Um, these are some of the other ways in which they might be characterized. The good old boy, the regular guy or girl, the person next door, the realist, the working stiff. You know, this is an interesting one. The working stiff and that they're sort of like, almost like a secondary character, right? the solid citizen, the good neighbor, or the silent majority. And this, this might be more of like the, the negative way in which they might be used, um, especially when you talk about like the, the uh, status quo, so to speak. Luego nos sigue el héroe. And the hero, you know, is, is kind of a, a universal one. You know, it, most people would understand it. It's a person that's trying to prove their worth through courageous acts. Um, where there's a will, there's a way is there is their motto. Um, and when I think of this character, their greatest fear is showing weakness, vulnerability, or being called a chicken. I think about um, Marty McFly in the, uh, the Back to the Future series. That was always his character flaw, that people, you know, call him chicken, he's going he's gonna to lash out. And so here, you know, it's his arrogance, right? And his always needing to fight another battle. That's what kept, keeps him getting into trouble and keeps getting in his way. And so at the very end of the series, you know, if you watch all of the movies, you'll see that in the very last movie, he finally gets over that by basically walking away from a fight. And uh, that's where, you know, his, his character arc will, will almost always take him. You know, the hero character will usually have that that type of uh, archetypal transformation um followed by that is the caregiver so here the caregiver you know love your neighbor as yourself right their their motto is to protect and serve ultimately um and to be as as selfless as possible um and they would be conflicted mostly in showing either selfishness or ingratitude you know in this case it might be a character that is um i don't know let's let's say it's a character that is so afraid of doing something for themselves that they spend the entire novel uh you know kind of fighting that urge to to want to um, do something that is for themselves um, and so what they do is they're going to try and do everything that they can to please other people in a lot of ways, the caregiver sort of blends in with the everyman and with the innocent character type. Um, those archetypes are, are archetypes that you'll see, um, you know, like I said before, in classic literature, usually portrayed as 
as women or as weak, ineffectual men. Um, you know, it, it's a very like chauvinistic way of representing a particular kind of character. Um, but they don't always have to be that way. You know, uh, the caregiver can sometimes be a very strong character. Like um, there's a movie in particular, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but it stars Robin Williams as a doctor. It's and, and it has Robert De Niro in it. And in that movie, you know, Robin Williams is the caregiver. He's a doctor. You know, it's very obvious. But he, through his, his work, is able to really help um, Robert De Niro's character live a much better life. And, you know, that, that's what kind of makes the Robin Williams character a, a, a true hero in that particular story. Um, and it's because of his compassion and generosity with himself. So it's not always a negative character. Um, as you can see here, they might be also called the saint or the altruist um, and the supporter. You know, definitely like that cheerleader character that you'll see in some in some stories. So Awakenings, yes. Thank you, Ani. That's the name of the movie, Awakenings. Um, so those were the ones that were their motivations came from their ego. Right, so that's how other people outside uh, view them. Any questions so far? I see. Abraham, did you raise your hand? Mistake. Ah, okay. All right. So, again, um, just to sort of uh, repeat myself, I guess, you know, that first that first group, you know, they're, they're dominated by their ego, their outward appearance. Right? So the next group is the soul group, right? So the soul group is about their internal, um, like satisfaction, right? They do things for more of a spiritual reason. And that starts off with the explorer and the explorer simply don't fence me in. That's, that's their motto. They want to always be out there living their life um, and feeling free. And, you know, that part of their, their yearning to always feel free um, usually means that they'll be characterized as being aimless, wandering, or as some kind of a misfit, right? Somebody that just cannot set down roots. Um, you know, this might be like an Indiana Jones character or a character that's considered like a... Uh, I don't know, um, probably typically an adventurer, you know, if you look at the, the, the also known as their AKAs, they might be the seeker, the iconoclast, the wanderer, the individualist or the pilgrim. Uh, so there's somebody that's just their reason for existing is to experience a better, more authentic, more fulfilling life. That's their main reason for, for living. And so through their journey, they're probably going to come across other people, you know, maybe save a town or, you know, save a civilization here and there, and then continue on and ride off into the sunset. You know, think like classic Western movies where the, the main character was, was your, your typical, um, you know, explorer character. Then we have the rebel. So like I was saying earlier, the rebel is kind of like the anti-hero, right? Rules are made to be broken. Um, and the reason why they, they live by that is because they really want to either incite revolution or have revenge on someone that has done them dirty. Um, and their ultimate goal is to overturn what isn't working. So they might be kind of like an anarchist, right? They're, they'll be a revolutionary. There'll be a character that is looking to topple the system and start everything over again. The best example that I can think of right now is the main character in the Fight Club. You know, the Fight Club is is all about you know an anti-hero who is a rebel looking to destroy um, everything through through uh, the the um, through getting rid of the financial system. So, um, and they're most biggest fear is to be powerless or ineffectual. Um, and 
they can come very close to leading a life of crime if they're going to be a, an actual hero. Even though, you know, the anti-hero is a lot of times going to be an actual criminal or at least considered by society to be a criminal. Um, that's why they're, they're also known as the outlaw or the vigilante or the revolutionary. Um, and just like the hero, they might be also an iconoclast, somebody that doesn't follow your typical, you know, societal structures. Then you have the lover, el amante. So this is a different kind of hero. Um, you know, their, their primary mission in life is to have, as you can see here, uh, relationships with people, with their work and their surroundings. Um, you know, they really want to essentially live life to its fullest um, in the most uh, sen sensual sort of way. Right. There'll be a character that is, um, I don't know, like always looking for the for the next best thing, the next uh, sensory overload kind of experience. Um, most of the times the lover is is rarely like the main character. You know, they might be sort of like a secondary character in stories, but uh, it is possible to tell the story of the lover um, in that, you know, they'll they'll do everything that they can to. Um, to fulfill their the person that they're going after. This is kind of like the romantic comedy sort of uh, character. Um, a movie that popped into my head right now was actually the movie Her. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is probably the, the archetypal lover character in that one um, because he absolutely fears being alone um, and being unwanted. So... And then we have the creator, the artist. Um, I think this one's pretty self-explanatory to most of us. You know, we're all probably looking at this and saying, yeah, that's me. Um, I can definitely say that for me. You know, I, I do fear being mediocre. Um, I don't ever want to look back on my life and say, man, I lived a very mediocre life um, or I did everything in a very mediocre way. I want it always to be the best that it can be. Um, and that's where I believe that to create things of enduring value, things that really are meaningful for people, that's that's that does ring true, at least for me. Um, you know, but the, the creator, the artist is going to be a character that uh, probably in a story or in a movie you'll see constantly is battling with themselves. There's a lot of internal conflict, you know, about like things needing to be perfect, you know, things needing to go the way that they imagine them and they're working meticulously to make sure that they actually happen the way that they envision it. Um, it's sort of a stereotype though, unfortunately. And that's where I was saying earlier, you really want to make sure that if you're, you're looking at these archetypes, you don't go the stereotypical route. You want to avoid stereotypes. The rebel is a huge theme in Mr. Robot. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that movie. Um, it's a show on oh, Amazon Prime. Ah, okay. It's about a vigilante hacker. Okay. Go ahead on. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely sounds like it's the rebel. That would be the archetype there. I see uh, Abraham's trying to be a, uh, what is that? Uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. <laughs> um, 007. Uh, that's an interesting one. James Bond. Is James Bond the true hero character or is he more the lover character? Right, he's kind of a blending of the two, isn't he? Um, because if you think about it, you know, as the hero, right, he's he's not really going to be committed to to anything other than his cause. Um, but then he uses his charm and his suave to get what he wants. So he's going to use the, he, the the lover tactics to ultimately accomplish his goal as a hero. Um, greatest fear, big facts. <laughs> 
That was in regards to the creator, the uh, greatest spirit of being the over. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. Um, see, San Juanita, what did I say about going against stereotypes? Uh, basically, stereotypes, you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're uh, especially if you're trying to portray like an artist character. I mean, what's the most common phrase that we all know about artists? Right? The starving artist or the artist that it goes crazy for his artwork. Um, you know, even a few weeks ago, we read that piece by Eduardo Galeano, you know, where Portinari only cared about his art. Right. And he cared about nothing else. That's a very stereotypical representation of the artist, of the creator. And so, you know, if you're looking at, like, say, the rebel character, right, you might think of like a Han Solo. You know, Han Solo is, is a rebel character, um, you know, and to make him the, the hero of his own story, like they did recently with the movie Solo, you know, Han Solo it could almost become like a, like a, like a parody, even, you know, if you overdo the whole rebel, um, idea uh, of what a rebel is, I don't know if I'm really being clear. Right. But if you, probably the, the best example that I could give is, is the artist, you know, the stereotype of an artist being kind of crazy, kind of being out there being unreliable, you know, living life on a whim. You know, I'm thinking of like the movie Mozart or, you know, Amadeus is called, you know, Amadeus is, is about Amadeus Mozart. And if you watch that movie, you know, you'll think that, that Amadeus Mozart was, was actually insane and, and only cared about having sex and, and drinking um, and was a genius when it came to his art. And, you know, that's, that's not necessarily, I think, a full representation of who he was as a person. You know, essentially what I'm saying is, yeah, don't, don't, don't fall into stereotyping when you're characterizing your characters. Understand that the archetype might say, you know, this is, this is the direction that these might be their main motivations, right? The artist's motivation might be to uh, craft perfect work, work that does have an enduring value. But you can show that in so many different ways, you know. Um, you could say that you could show that by like a person that really studies their craft, you know, and dedicates all of their time to reading and writing, uh, like the movie Finding Forrester. Um, that's a really good movie about a, a young black boy in high school that, you know, becomes friends with an author. And because the, the young man is, is a writer himself, he ends up really dedicating his 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 time to perfecting his, his writing. Um, <clears throat> let me see the other questions in the chat. Uh, anyone seen Mozart in the jungle? So entertaining, but are the characters stereotypes of artists? I haven't seen that movie, but, or that show, but maybe. I think that's a question that we always need to ask ourselves as we're, as we're, uh, you know, watching things, as we're reading things. You know, is this being stereotypical or are they really being innovative in the way that they're crafting these characters? Are they using more than one archetype to tell us the story of a character? That's why it's really important to think about, you know, all of the other tools that we use throughout the, the last few weeks in, in characterizing our, our characters. So we're almost done. Feel free to jump in at any time if you guys have questions or comments. So this is the last kind of uh, type. This is the self type. <clears throat> so this one's, I mean, even though the word ego is uh, used for the other ones, you know, and talking about their, their presentation to the world, the self types are the ones that are really about, you know, themselves. Right? This is about their personal, their, their own individual self. They're what most people would, would call an ego. These are characters that tend to be kind of egocentric. Um, and we have obviously the gesture. 
And the jester's motto is you only live once. And so a lot of times they'll spend their story or their, their appearance in a story playing jokes, you know, um, probably being like the life of the party, quote unquote. You know, they might be the drunkard. They might be, you know, the, the person always cracking jokes. They'll be the comedic relief a lot of times. Um, but if it was their story, and they were the, the hero of their story. You know, they might start off that way. And then over time, they will learn to mature. They would learn to become a character that was a little bit more responsible, but still able to live in the moment with full enjoyment. That's their main thing is that they really want to live a life that they personally enjoy. Um, and, you know, to bring a little bit of joy to other people. But it's really always about themselves. It, it begins always with themselves and their personal needs first. That is also true of the sage or the wise man. Um, this is a person that, uh, you know, the character will really be always looking to find the truth, as it says here, right? Their main purpose is to understand and analyze the world so that they can find whatever is truth, considered truth to them. Um, and, you know, that might mean that in their story, they'll probably forsake all of their relationships. You know, they might be, you know, as, as it shows down here, you know, the expert, the scholar. You know, if you think of movies where um, it follows like a, uh, you know, a professor or, or some sort of philosopher, um, you know, I'm thinking of, of uh, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, you know, where, where he plays a character that that is, uh, you know, under under a lot of stress and eventually has like a, I think, a mental break. They have a, a, an actual disability. And, um, you know, that character, you know, is so focused on, you know, solving his mathematical equations that he, he starts to treat his, his wife, I believe you know, in a very poor way. And in the end, he learns to overcome that. Um, so that's the sage. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think, pretty, pretty easy to see a lot of these in, in media. Then we have the wizard or the magician. And, you know, if this character, um, you know, you could probably imagine that this is the, the character that, like, is, is going to appear in, like, a... Uh, in, in sort of like a fantasy type of novel or movie. Um, you know, you could think of like Gandalf the Grey and the, the Hobbit or or uh, the Lord of the Rings. Um, this might be like a kind of like a Harry Potter sort of character. Um, you know, they make things happen is their motto. Uh, there's a bit of, a, of an arrogance to them, um, especially if they're like the older character, you know, like Gandalf the Grey. Um, but their main goal is to make dreams come true. And, you know, they're, they're usually portrayed in a very uh, positive way, um, even though at times they might come across as manipulative. You know, that is their weakness, is that they use other people to eventually gain what they want out of life, which is understanding the fundamental laws of the universe. They're almost identical to the sage, um, but where the sage is really about that personal understanding of the truth. The wizard is usually uh, willing to share that understanding of the truth um, to have a, a better, happier world. So they're also known as the visionary, the inventor, the charismatic leader, the medicine man, you know, all of these different uh, types of characters that you'll probably see in history. And the last one is the ruler, the soberano. Um, I think, again, this one is pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, they usually will come across as author authoritarian or not able to delegate, you know, like the control freak. Um, this type of character, they ultimately want control, and that's all they really care about. Um, but their motivation, the reason why they want control, is so that they can create a prosperous, successful family or community. So 
they might come across as as being a very bad character, but their motivations is usually something that is actually more community oriented, family oriented. Um, and in the end of their of their hero's journey, they'll usually learn to accept that they need help from other people in order to create this prosperous, successful family or community. Um, and as you can see here, they're also known as the boss, the leader, the aristocrat, the king, queen, politician, role model, manager, or administrator. Y tan tan, ya se acabó. <laughs> so, any questions? Or the rich guy in the novela. Yeah, the ruler could probably be the rich guy in the novela too. <laughs> um, let me see, questions in the chat. Uh, looks like a lot of things came up while I was talking. Um, so San Juanita, you were asking for another example of which character? I wasn't very clear with what you said earlier about, and I want to, I want, I don't want to keep the class from advancing, but I mean, I can write to you later on because I need to know what you meant by, what was it? Oh yeah, what did you say about going against stereotypes? And you gave me an example, but I wasn't too clear. I'm still confused, but if you want me to, I can write to you later on. So we won't hold the class back. No, I think that that's a really good question because, you know, again, uh, these are archetypes, right? right. These are, these are the, the proto form for any kind of character that you might write about in the future. And so understanding that these characters exist in our subconscious means that you could begin writing a character and you can mask it so well that people won't even realize that they're watching an archetypal character, even though they are or that they're reading a, about an archetypal character. And now, if you stereotype it and you go overboard in the stereotyping using cliches and, you know, using, um, you know, what people already kind of understand a quote-unquote rebel to be, for example, you know, it's, it's going to be very obvious, right? And it might make for a very flat character. But if you were to, like, say, mix in a little bit of, uh, I don't know, hero tendencies, in the rebel, you know, you might start to get a slightly more interesting character. Or if your hero is also a jester, right? Their reason is, you know, their reason for existing is to to make a better world, but using, you know, comedy as a way to, to, to get to that. Um, you know, so you can start to blend these characters and show they have various aspects to their personality. Marisa? Thank you. Very clear. Thank you very much. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> cool. Mauricio? Well, I was just had another example for San Juanita. She needed something. Like, I guess what Luis is trying to say is like, okay, there's a show that I've been watching um, called Mr. Robot. It's about a rebel who basically hacks corporations just to you know get back at the system. But he's not just a total rebel because he also hacks like regular people to help others. Like I think in the first episode, it's not giving too much away, but he hacks a guy who he finds that he has like child pornography on his system. And he actually like, he contacts him and he like, gives him a tip to the police. So he's kind of like a Robin Hood hero. Mm -hmm. So like he, he kind of he, like the total mix that whole level idea that all of like a, like a caretaker. Someone that doesn't like no one knows who he is, but he sees himself as kind of like someone to help people and like on a very smaller level. So, like, like when you combine all these different like motivations, I think you build like a richer character than just oh he's just mm -hmm. a straight up rebel mm -hmm. who just doesn't care about the system and wants to see it burned up. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits of being able to write long form. You know, you can show more characterization, more character arcs, you know, in like a series than you can in a movie um, or in a novel where as opposed to a short story. But that being said, 
those things can also be done in flash fiction. You know, you can really show a person change in a matter of seconds based on how you characterize them, based on, you know, the things that you tell us indirectly about who they are. You know, everything that, I, that I've gone over today is about direct characterization, right? You're, you're going to use, you know, the, the, the actions that they do, the job that they have, the type of clothing that they wear to show us you know, that a character is the lover, right? But through indirect characterization, you know, the things that they think, the things that they say, the items that they carry with them, you know, that lover archetype could also be a sage archetype. You know, the lover might be looking to have strong relationships, you know, with people, but he's also very intellectual, you know, carries around notebooks and, you know, writes and is, uh, you know, the author of several, I don't know, novels, right? So like there's ways where you can blend all of these different kinds of motivation in a very, very compact space and still tell the story that you want to, you want to tell. So this is just, you know, I think, more about your awareness because a lot of you i don't think you know did it on purpose but in some of the the writing that i that i've read over the last few weeks you're all kind of doing this you're creating archetypal characters <clears throat> um, and not to call you out nikolai but nikolai in particular has been doing a really good job of writing these very very short pieces you know, pieces that are just over a page long that really do characterize the characters that he's introducing um, and showing me, really showing me the, the type of archetype that they, that they fit in. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very possible to do this and to still tell a story. <coughs> Any questions or final comments? We've gone a little bit over today, but. Yeah, good. <clears throat> Nettie, I see you raising your hand. Uh, I'm trying to like, this is a lot of information, but just trying to make sense of this. I'm really rethinking the whole thing. Um, I was thinking maybe building a character, two archetypes, where one is dominant, will help to develop the character. But if by any reason you try to go with three or more archetypes, it's going to be a, a mess. You can actually be one of the story. I was just trying to find this place of <laughs> equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would suggest, you know, in, in storytelling, I would suggest, you know, understand that you're going to be creating an archetype or you're going to be creating based off of an archetype, no matter what you do, right? Remember what I said earlier, this is the scaffold. These are the bones by which you're creating a person, a character. And so, you know, your character will have traits that might be mostly one archetype, Right. Like Robin Hood is a rebel archetype for sure to answer Ani's question. Um, but Robin Hood is also going to have characteristics of the hero, um, you know, characteristics of the lover. It's, it's not going to be obvious throughout the entire story that 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 character is, you know, the, the one and only rebel. Right. Um, they'll use the same sort of personality traits of these other characters. Just like you do in every single day of your life. One moment you might behave more like a jester and another moment, you know, half an hour later, you're being a rebel, you know. And they may have similar reasons for, for existing in, in you at any given moment, but, you know, they're there, there. All of these characters are there. They're all within us. Uh, examples of flash fiction. 
Um, so Ani's asking about examples of flash fiction. Uh, there's actually uh, like the best American flash fiction volumes, collections. Those are, those are sometimes good places. Um, but really one of the best ones that I can honestly think of off the top of my head is Eduardo Galeano's Book of Embraces. Um, that's where we read the Portinari story from. And uh, that is nothing but flash fiction. All of those stories are maybe like one page long, um, sometimes even less. They're like, there's a few that are maybe like three paragraphs and that's it. Uh, flash fiction as a, as a genre is kind of, kind of amazing, to be honest with you. It's like the poetry of prose. Yeah, and the Midnight NYC does have competitions. Yes, San Juanita. And how, how could you, you know about Sandra Cisneros' uh, vignettes, right? Mm -hmm. How does that compare to flash fiction? Vignettes are typically flash fiction. I mean, right? there's there's yeah. like a threshold, you know, depending on who you who you talk to about what is a short story versus a flash fiction. But, <clears throat> but ultimately, yeah. They're not, not short stories, but they're vignettes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it comes down to page count, ultimately. Flash fiction can be as long as like 300 words, which basically is like two pages. But normally most people consider flash fiction to be less than 300 words about 250 or less but it's still a story right because yeah it is a story okay yeah full complete stories beginning middle and end you know show a character arc um of some type okay. yeah they're, okay. they're pretty amazing <laughs> all right so any any final questions or thoughts No. All right. I know I gave you guys a lot. And, um, you know, ultimately today's lesson was really more to just acknowledge what I think was, you know, maybe something that I didn't acknowledge before about, you know, characterization, which is, um, you know, there's two forms. There's the direct. The direct characterization usually is based off of archetypes. Um, and then there's the indirect, which is what I was having you all really practice the most. Um, because in my opinion, honestly, indirect characterization is the best form of, of characterization. You can really flesh out a character by, you know, showing their tendencies, their, their thoughts, their actions or inactions. So um, with that being said, I'm not going to give you guys a writing prompt this time around. Um, for next week, we're, we're doing a, a workshop session. So, you know, feel free to take what you learned today and, and apply it to your writing if you feel like it'll work. Um, you know, but yeah, just come prepared to workshop next week. Um, you know, if you have any questions about anything that we talked about today, uh, you know, feel free to, to email me or, or post up your question in the in the Google Classroom stream so everyone else can can see your question and also see my answer. Um, and this video will obviously go up on YouTube too. Uh, it won't be blocked this time. There's no copyright infringements going on here. <laughs> so yeah, that's it for today. Any last thoughts, parting wishes? You're welcome. No? All right. Well, for those of you that do celebrate Christmas, you know, I wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. Happy, happy day. Um, yeah, happy Christmas, everyone. Que se la pasen muy lindo. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking to each other soon. Take care, all. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>